Wallies, follies, and lick'em lollies. Can you believe it, folks? Saturday night, it's the interview with the Rhino. And that's it. <laughs> come on, come on. Good to have you here, folks. We're going to run down quite a few topics tonight. Uh, just first going to check in with everybody, uh, see what everyone's drinking tonight. Chad, what's in the glass over your way? Uh, right now, it's Alberta Genuine Draft Light. Okay. How about for yourself, sir? Uh, over here, it is. Sorry about that. I just want to get as many screens as I can have going at once here. Uh, tonight, we celebrate a beer that hasn't been, uh, it's a style of beer that hasn't been brewed since pretty much kind of, I'd say, around 1993 is when it really hit its peak. Um, we've got uh, our friends from uh, mostly Labatt, Molson, Stroves here. So it's uh, Old Milwaukee Carling and Maximum Ice. Nice. I can say when it's cold. How are you feeling, Chad? When it's cold, the Alberta Genuine Draft is a lot better. Is uh, El uh, we've uh, we've come across a few of these genuine drafts. Is that uh, does that have a percentage or is it non-alcoholic? Uh, this is four percent. Very nice. A nice sessionable ale to claw over some hard hitting questions. Brian's here. Again, yeah, I'll read the comments. Uh, Sapporo here. And Brian says it was a gift. A friend of mine was drinking Sapporo, Sapporo in the regular can or in the corrugated metal can that you can't break if you stand on it. Because that matters. Exactly. Yeah. They're both pretty sturdy cans, but the one, I think the one you're talking about, the corrugated one, uh, it's almost shaped like a pint glass, correct? Yes. You can rob a fucking bank with that thing. All right, well, we're all here. Let's get going, Chad. Okay. I'm going to go right for, going to go for a big one right off the bat. Oh, yay. I want to talk, I want to talk to you about, you're familiar with this topic. Beer personalities on YouTube. Now you've come a long way. You started in 2008, 2009, at least when you started uh, videotaping yourself. Until now, yeah. uh, you've seen a whole pile of. There's, there's guys that still keep coming out. There's, there's, there's guys that are brand new at it, uh, giving us a review of you know this is old Milwaukee, and, and uh, it's still it's it's a fantastic hobby. Uh, it was it went from the written world to um, to video. Uh, Stephen Beaumont is still writing books on, you know, he beers sure of the world. Really is. Yep. So the, we can just go at this for a bit because there's a lot to chew in here. Where do you see um, beer reviewing on YouTube from when you started to where it is now? Uh, when I started, there was so few. I mean, there was a couple guys in the U.S. There was a couple guys in Europe. There was a few here in Canada. I believe uh, Hoogly was probably one of the first in Canada, Lee. Um, that I can remember. Uh, there was a bunch of guys that have no longer done it. There was another Chris uh, who would pop open all of his bottles with a uh, with a lighter. There was so many people that have come and gone. Uh, I remember I remember some of them by name. I don't remember others by name, but there there's it, it, the the pool has has been like tides coming and going uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the old timers don't seem to be around doing it anymore some of us have passed on some of us just found other things to do some of us lost the passion in it uh, but i mean where do i see it going how have i seen it moving it it here's the interesting thing right uh and we we've talked about this in the past as well there seems to be a a weird subgenre for this right there's the people that do it because they love it there's the people that do it for a hobby right. and there's people that do it for an in into the industry such as the maple ruski 
who started beer reviewing came to meet me. I brought him into some breweries. He got some he got some foots in the door. He ended up going to the Niagara College teaching brewery, and now he is he's brewing in the That's industry. Right. Yeah. Uh, doesn't review anymore, really. He'll he'll do some beer videos here and there, but once you're in the industry and you're working at a brewery, it's kind of frowned upon to be talking, you know, ratings on somebody else's beer. And then there's guys that do it solely to try right. and shill free alcohol. And there's a lot of them in every country you you pass by. And these guys will usually either say every beer is really good or will only say the beer is really good if they didn't have to pay for it. Okay. Uh, we, know, we know one of them in the U.S. who tries his his damnedest to get a free everything and every beer he drinks is amazing a plus uh we know one in the hamilton area who reviews from his grotto and will go into a brewery and be like well you got to give this to me for free because of who i am uh it's an intriguing intriguing subgenre that happens with everybody right there's people that that become there's people that become very 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 snobbish in the hobby and they know everything and everybody else knows nothing they're what they say matters more than anybody else's there's people that would ask questions like i don't know what the abv of the of this is because it's not on the can maybe it's this and get well why the fuck would it be that they already have that type of beer. shut up <laughs> like the whole thing is right. is there should be some camaraderie and everything else but i i, I don't know i i think I think I think that group that you're talking about, like for beer snobs, it's generally a small group. Like I know, particularly with like, with home brewing groups, there's never really home brewing guys giving other home brewing guys like a hard a hard time about things. Uh, in regards to, um, you know, what beer you should be drinking and that kind of stuff. That because that you know you can stitch this. That that doesn't belong in our in, in our community. Anyway, continue. Yeah, no. Uh, well, like I was saying, it's it's an interesting thing because there is so many different subgenres in the beer reviewing community, and again, uh, a lot of the old timers that I started watching don't do it anymore or are gone. Uh, I remember one of the first people I watched was uh, the I'm a So Fats, and uh, Jake and Dar, and Hoogly, right. and uh, Terry Beer Goggles, uh, who has passed. Um, Kent's beer reviews, Keith's beer reviews. Is pardon me, is Kent is, uh, and for those uh, just, um, uh, Chad's dealing with a bit of an ear infection, uh, just in regards to his voice, and he's not, uh, he's not one hundred percent, but he's raring to go. Is uh, is Kent still with us? I don't know, to be honest. Yeah. I yeah. I've heard I heard rumors a few different times that he wasn't with us anymore, and then he always right. popped up again. So I I don't know. Uh, there, there's been a few guys, and I mean, there was, and some of them weren't actually all that old. Like, like Terry wasn't that old. Um, mm -hmm. Dave's health, uh, Tuvar, the the Urban Viking Ale reviews. Tuvar's health isn't the greatest. Uh, like it's, and it's sad because these are guys that are all in like our age range, not necessarily exactly our age. Mm -hmm. Most of them are older than us, but only like. 10 or 15 years older than us right like so it's it's one of those things it's 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 sad but it's been that a, a tremendous community and the, just the people we've met along along the way you and i uh you and i uh, are tremendous friends now and we met pretty much through beer reviews yeah you uh you came over to the house uh what after after my ex-wife left and we I was picking my life back up at the time and hung out and have been pretty close since then. Yeah. But I mean, there, like I said, there's been guys that have been amazing and I don't know where they've gone. There's been guys that were amazing and I know exactly what's going on with them. There are people that I didn't give a shit if they were on fire. Um, there are, there's other people. And I mean, I always say that there's no wrong tasting notes, but there's other people that I'm always amazed even started doing this. And I'm like, how the fuck did you go right. on for a while? Uh, <coughs> Alcoholocaust, <coughs> you know, stuff like that. Like, how did you do this for as long as you did? Because it, it was insanity. There are guys that do it like me where there's almost no production value in it. There are guys that 
spend hours editing videos. I don't know why you'd edit review videos because we're such a niche market. Um, mm -hmm. There's guys like, I don't even know if he still does it, but there's there's guys that's channels blew up because of purchasing subs. Uh, Greg's beer reviews, stuff like that. Like there's just, there's, and then there's the other sub genres. There's stuff like Craig Tube, the home brewing side of things. There's guys right. that uh, the the alchemist, their brewers do their own channel talking about brewing beer and everything. Uh, you have uh, you have a whole bunch of big breweries bringing in high class people doing things now too. Uh, for a little while, you were getting videos from Michael Jackson uh, after he was gone already, but you were getting videos of him doing things posted by different beer channels as well. So the the umbrella of the beer industry on youtube is immense it could go anywhere it could just completely dry up i mean i'm i'm a small time channel in comparison to some of the channels but there's a lot of channels that don't get a lot of views there's a lot of channels that got more views by doing things like uh a certain person put his wife in front of the camera instead of himself and his wife got him a lot more views because most people interested in beer and interested in hearing what people think of beer are men you put a girl with with boobs and all that out guess who what, what channel is getting the views i can give you a hint it's just a matter of what you're getting the views for why you're trying to collect the hits are you trying to spread the word of beer or are you just are you just looking for hits speaking of which um being that we're looking at a span of close to 20 years since you since you started now there's been a massive shift in this current generation's attention span and i'm seeing a lot more beer reviews through shorts that generally just a beer review done in 30 seconds and you don't quite well maybe because we're just an older generation now i can't pick up on the person's personality because it just moves too quick yeah see i've my biggest problem is when i do the reviews by myself and i i do notice there's a bunch of comments and chris will get to them uh when i do the reviews by myself i have a hard time staying on topic i ramble a lot my videos go a lot longer than when we're doing group reviews. When we do group reviews, three minutes to six minutes is our usual usual hit. But you're right; those thirty second, forty second shorts seem to be the new thing. You know, like pop it open, pour it, it's good. You know, like. <coughs> and I, I, I don't, I don't want to do the editing, so that's why mine still stay the same. I could, I could edit in a bunch of shorts and put shorts out myself, but. It's a lot more work. Chad, do you want to? Chad, do you want to pull some comments up, and I'll uh, I'll just read them uh, off for you. We, we have we have Brian's newest one up right now. Brian's talking about uh, his Sapporo. What do you have with the Sapporo? That's a fine. Uh, that's a very dry beer. Nice with chicken wings. Uh, Still Beers for breakfast is here. Good day, Drew. What's going on? Good day. Good day. Now he is actually in connection with a lot of the newer, newer generation of uh, of beer reviewers, guys that started long after I did, for the most part. Uh, and they right. they span all over Ontario. He he's connected with some guys in in Manitoba and stuff as well. And again, newer channels, not necessarily new channels, but newer channels. And uh, uh, Bruce Brex, he does uh, he does shorts as well. Uh, he says here that he talked to Kent. He says I talked to Kent beer reviews a few times, and he uh, he solidifies that Kent is around. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Brian's got a question here. Does a does a beer reviewer lose any creed if they do re-reviews years later after a palate change? That's a very good question. And it's a question we've we've talked about a few times. And uh, I think if you're doing a re-review all the time, you you aren't being hundred percent truthful. You're you're milking those those views. If you're doing a re like if I was to come out and re-review, I don't know, what were some of my first reviews? Like 
Bud. If I was to Hogarden. review Bud now, Whole Garden. Fucking 15 like fucking that. minutes on Whole Garden. <laughs> yeah. If I was to review something like that now, okay, maybe, I mean, a bit again, like 10 years later, 13 years later, it, it kind of makes sense to touch on it again. But at the same time, do I care enough to go and touch on it again? Uh, right. Because there's always something new out there. And I mean, I can't... I can't say that a lot of the beers that I made fun of younger days, I actually hated. And you would get that when we actually gave the rating. Like, we would drink a beer and we'd be like, that's a fucking horse pest. Ah, And then we'd be like, you know, six out of ten. Because it's not actually a bad beer. It's just... And the more beers you have, the better something might slip into, right? Like, when you first start drinking beer you might find your worst beer ever. And you're like, that's a zero out of 10. And then after that, you're like, wait a second, this next beer is worse or this beer is worse. Or so it it can actually start moving things up the ladder. Uh, And as I'm getting older, I'm finding that I, I can accept a lot more beers than I could in the past. Like a lot of things that I wouldn't normally have ever touched. I can stomach now fairly, fairly reasonably. Uh, but it, it, it's a weird, it's a weird conundrum. Do I, do I feel that you should lose Creed for re-reviewing? Not necessarily, because again, a palette change happens and they say anywhere from five to seven years, you'll probably see a palette change. But at the same time, I, I don't know, depending on, dependent on where you are and whether or not you have connections outside of where you are would depend on how I feel about that. Like for me, at some point, I'll run out of Saskatchewan beers to drink. However, I have connections in Ontario. I have connections in Quebec. I have connections in the U.S. I have connections in B.C. Uh, I have a connection in Alberta. I should be able to always have enough stuff rolling to always have something new on the go. So I shouldn't have to go back. However, if I didn't have those connections, mm-hmm. going back might be acceptable, especially when you figure that some of these beers are now brewed in different places. Like the the Molson Canadian I would buy here is brewed around here. It's not brewed in Ontario or Quebec. So Even the, re- the recipes those, are different. The, well, the recipes should be the same, but the water might be different. The Who's brewing it's different. And as we both know, every single brewer has their own way of doing things, even if the recipe is the same. I'm going to reach back here and grab another beer. So that that one that's up right now is another I think that answers Brian's question, but I think for some of the type of beers that we... We lost Chris. Oh, we have Chris back. So with pepperoni, onions, and bacon. No. We've lost Chris's sound again, guys, so we'll give him a second to come back in. But what are your thoughts, guys, on how things are going to change in beer reviewing on YouTube? Now, see, I'm not saying don't do that, Drew. Do do you do things however you want to do them. I think it's a little bit of overkill to re-review a beer or revisit a beer every year. I, I really do because, again, your palate shouldn't change in that time, uh, especially when you're looking at uh, domestics, at, at macros and stuff. That really shouldn't change. It should be the same over and over again. Uh but again, do you do what do what works for you? If that's how you want to do your thing, do that thing. But 
since he was posing that question towards me in my thoughts, I do think that it's it's a little bit of an overkill. I only need to see so many reviews of of Laker Ice or or of Miller High Life, and I only need to see a certain person talk about Laker Ice or Miller High Life so many times to know what their thoughts are on it. Craft beers are a weird one, though. I mean, re -revis revisiting a craft beer after a year, the recipe may have changed. You'd really hope it didn't, especially if the name stayed the same. But it happens all the time. Uh, there is craft brewers whose entire thing is that they they change their recipes and and play that way. And it, it's just a weird thing to me. Don't name it the same thing if you've changed the recipe. However, uh, craft brewers, unlike major brewers, they will get different crops and stuff and things taste this differently. But I still think, you know, revisiting every something every year, unless it's a vintage, like every year it has its... It, if, if you're looking at like bring out your dead 2020 and then bring out your dead 2021 and bring out your dead 2022, okay, those things are different. But if we're talking, hey, every year I look at uh, Stranger Than Fiction by Collective Arts, I, I think it's a little bit of overkill. But again, I'm not saying you're wrong in doing it. Do things your way. Do things the way it works for you. That there's, it would be a complete drab if everybody just did everything the, the same way. It's kind of funky, too, with the um, with the re-reviews, because you can do something like a throwback Thursday and go back and and, do, and just do an update. Just... It's just find a way to make it to, and keep it fresh. And that's why I'm saying, don't, don't, I'm not the be all end all. I'm saying my thoughts on it, but whatever works for your channel, works for your viewers, works for you yourself is what to do. Um, well, Brian's uh, comment here is he says, the long form videos show the experience, the can, the pour, the smell, etc. YouTube short skips all of that experience, but. There's something still to be said though, because like I said, beers for beers for breakfast. What a fucking name! <laughs> beers for breakfast uh, does do shorts as well, but I mean, I find that uh, beers for breakfast gets its in shorts. But I think you're right. At the same time, I mean, the shorts are the way things seem to be going. I mean, even the algorithms seem to push shorts and everything else. It's it's they know that attention spans are going down people are like i don't have enough time even though they're sitting on the toilet watching this shit half the time i don't have the time to do this anymore so shorts are the way things are going so i get it but i agree you kind of miss the experience and i agree with you as well you kind of miss the person's personality and the shorts that make the most money let's let's i'll be 100 percent honest here right the shorts that make the most money in all of tiktok YouTube, Facebook, it's it's the girls dancing. That's what that's what makes the money. Right. If that's what you're <laughs> after doing. Yeah. Let's, we gotta get some more girls on the albino rhino. Bring back what's her name from the uh from the basement videos? The one that was always in the bikini. Hooked oh, up with the, the um with the, the, hunter, the, not the videos? Uh yeah, that's it. Yeah, the commander. Everybody gets a nickname. All right. Uh, beers for breakfast. Chime in. Just want to know what you're drinking tonight. What are you drinking? What are you eating? If there's anybody I missed, uh, I don't see the chat room in front of me. I don't have the the names. But uh, just it's always part of the show. What are you drinking? What are you eating? So far, the only two that have really talked to us is Drew and Brian. So. Right on. Where the hell is Dave? I'm going gotta, gotta to turn that into a T-shirt. Now, here's a funny one. Has the Belgian beer scene gone a bit quiet? Ooh. You know what? I I was just sending beers to to Brian to pick up for me in the Niagara region. I was looking at breweries I don't normally look at. Um, just to see what they had, right? Because I'm like Let's see, let's see what some breweries have out right now. And I went and looked at uh Newark, Newark Brewing Company. Okay. And they have four beers. And one of them was a double. And it's the first time I've seen a double in a while. So it's actually funny you bring that up. Because it does seem to have slowed down quite a bit, right? Like, you used to always see Belgian wits all, all over the place. A brewery would be more akin to make a Belgian wit than a German half or a, or a Crystal Weizen or something like that quite often because the Belgian wit had more flavor. Um, you would always, you would almost always see something like uh, a, a 
Belgian blonde or a Belgian pale or a Belgian double, triple quad. quad. Uh, you don't see it as much anymore. And even I the, actually, uh, sorry, ahead. I was going to say uh, the big boys as well. In regards, we talked about before about uh, about Chimay, uh Duvel. Even uh, even Blue Moon is supposed to be a, a a Belgian wit. Like I mean, even the the big guys had to get in on the Belgian kick that was going on 10, 15 years ago. Uh, craft breweries, everybody was taking their shot at uh, as um, uh, like the I, I can't remember the name of the brewery that does Findumont Brasserie. To help me out. Um, oh fuck! Launched <laughs> those guys, but uh, they refer to their beer coming from Quebec as a Belgian style beer. They never completely call it uh, Belgian, but yeah, we've got a little bit of a disappearing act going on with uh, the Belgian craze. Yeah, and they do. They did like everything. They had Trois Pistoles, La Fin de Monde, uh, Maudit, uh, Raftman. Uh, every one of their beers was a Belgian style. They're they're uh, they're owned by Sleeman, aren't they? Oh, who the fuck are they though? Well, Unibrew, Unibrew. Okay. But yeah, I, they are uh, they are a Sleeman product nowadays, and they're one of those breweries where once the big guy took them over. The beer basically stayed the same. All the big guy did was give them the money to push across the country further and expand and everything. And they did a really good job. And they still, they, they're still a pretty solid brewery when you can find them. But I mean, like even Orval, you don't see Orval much anymore. I loved Orval. You used to be able to find Rochefort everywhere. I can't find Rochefort anywhere anymore. I mean, at one point, the best beer in the world was thought to be West Belter Terran. And you don't even hear that being strewn across as the best beer in the world anymore. Right. Not that I agree that it's the best beer in the world, but I'm just saying, like, that's what people would always talk about as the best beer ever. And, yeah, you you don't... Even even when I look at the LCBO's, uh, <coughs> their winter gift packs and all that, they used to have so many uh, so many Belgian winter gift packs, and they just don't seem to have them anymore. It's it's an does intriguing Stella, thing. Does Stella still advertise itself as a Belgian beer? Yes, they do. But I mean, they're just an American blonde blogger, right? Like it it is what it is. But I mean, then you think back, right? And I'm thinking here too. There's so many, even just in Ontario, there's so many breweries that were Belgian breweries in Ontario or Belgian styled or Belgian inspired. You had like the Exchange. In Niagara on the Lake, you had Bench in uh, in in Beamsville. You had uh, you had New Limburg in Simcoe. These are all breweries that made their money on Belgian beers and Belgian beer styles, and you don't hear about them as much anymore. Do you hear much from them? <laughs> oh, so you, you look you look at what you just opened up. I didn't even think about this until just now. Some of those breweries that you just listed, uh, like ben Bench, for example, are they still are they still brewing? Are they still in practice? Bench is still brewing. Uh, Exchange is still brewing. New Limburg, from the last time I heard, they are still brewing. A uh, New Limburg it was in an amazing building. It was a it was an old school that they turned into a brewery. And you'd walk in, and they still had like the asbestos tiles with the with the brass around the tiles and everything like that. You'd go into the bathroom, and they had the big the big round sinks that had the foot pedal. It was awesome. Okay. Uh, we have four comments right now. We have this one that's up right now. Brian's suggesting you put on your pasties. We can get some more hits. <laughs> No, but people would give us hits just to make us go away. <laughs> uh, beers for breakfast. I'm having a side lunch, hazy IPA, and having an orange to eat. I see this is a good comment from Brian. Uh, well put, too. IPA horniness in the craft world has killed Belgian beer. I, I suppose he means in our neck of the woods. Let's say in Ontario, Canada. But we had Belgian IPAs too, didn't we? We did. We had Belgian IPAs for a bit. Uh, P, I don't know who this is. 
uh, very generous. Uh, someone sent you $25. Hope it all is well. Saskatchewan will be good to you. Well, thank you very much. Saskatchewan has been pretty good to me. Uh, if the job market opened for me, it would be even better. Uh, but yeah, it's been pretty good. It's been pretty good. It's It's been the best thing for my family that we've had in the last seven years. Um, me and my wife talked about this, and then we talked about this a little bit on the pre-show I did. Uh, we were talking when we were at the Cornwall Center about how we both thought we would be further ahead in life by the time we were this age. And I think most people do when they when they get to that almost midlife crisis, like I'm turning 42 this year, I'm getting I'm getting very close to that. Oh, my God moment. And uh, we're like, we both thought we'd be doing better than we are. But we both had to restart our entire lives so many times in the last seven or eight years that when we look back at it, we're actually doing OK it's just we thought we'd be further ahead and it is what it is right um you're married with two kids in a house and you get up and go to work every day i think that's 42 three, that's 42 have, to a t i have three other kids though that don't live with me and uh yeah before we go on to this next topic i want to just go back a bit um when we're talking about uh, beer personalities i want to get to know you a little bit better on this one how active are you in conversation with people in Saskatchewan about beer? Like, do you talk to people at the beer store? I know you're looking for work, but um, how active I are you in the, in the community in Saskatchewan with beer? I am getting known. Uh, I did walk into Multinational, and I walked into Multinational because they had uh, four new beers listed. And I walked in to get them, and I'm like, hey, I, I read something about a Brussels sprout beer. And they're like, oh, that was an April Fool's joke. I'm like, you motherfuckers. And they're like, what? I'm like, I made a Brussels sprout beer. It was good. What the fuck? And we, we were got, and the, it was the owner of the brewery talking to me. And he looked at me and goes, you're the albino rhino, aren't you? I go, yep. Goes, I'm, I've been trying to talk my brewers into actually making that beer since they, since they did it. Because I'm like, everything in this beer, I would drink. And I'm like, and we talked about things that we, we've done. We've talked about things that I've done. We've talked about things that my buddies have done. Like we talked about the albino beer from uh, from Cayman Kettle that Dave was too scared to bring to the festival. Right. Dave made an albino beer. It was an all adjunct beer. It had like no malt in it. It was like rice, uh, corn, potatoes, like everything you could think of. He just wanted the beer to be white. And it was. It was whiter than my beard. It tasted like drywall spackle okay but it was albino right it was as white as you could be and i'm like you should bring this to the festival he's like it's gonna suck i don't want to bring it to the festival i go this will be the hit of the festival people will be coming to you to get this beer he goes but you you said it tastes like drywall paste i go that doesn't matter people are going to be so excited that they fucking had an albino beer you need to bring this and he he refused to bring it <laughs> This impatient people, are too scared, of right? people are too scared of things like that. Uh, just like when me and George did the why not beer, which was the smoked meat asparagus beer. People are like, well, well, why would you make that? People aren't going to like it. I go, why not? People are going to buy it. They're going to be like, I want to know what the smoked meat asparagus beer tastes like. And they're going to drink it and say, this is disgusting. But we don't care because why not try it, right? It's, it's the only way. So, yeah, a, a lot of breweries I've been talking to, I have talked to uh, the manager of the urban sellers I go into. Like I said, I have a I have a little bit of a, a deal with her where they, when they get in a new product that they want to push, right? they'll give it to me to review. Um, so, I mean, I have been talking to people. I have been getting becoming known in, in Regina, at least. But... Am I on the corner, like, on top of a soapbox, crying, uh, like being a street crier about uh, about beer? No, but yeah, I am talking to people. Even in the in the stores, I'm talking to people that are buying things. I'm like, what do you buy? Why do you buy it? What what do you like? Where do you go? What do you? Because I'd like I like to understand the the market I'm in now because I understand my old market quite well. I don't understand this market as well yet. I consider you fairly loud. I always have. Uh, with the beer reviews that you're doing right now, because you've, you've been really, it comes across anyway, because I know you save them up and then you down, uh, you upload them. So, But you've been really pumping out the reviews. Where 
in what direction are you trying to go with your beer reviews? Well, in what way do you mean what direction am I trying to go? Like, uh, am I trying to reinvent myself? Is that what you're you're trying to ask? Or what to, um, What do you get out of it when you sit down in front of the camera and do a beer review? Uh, I get to burn off some steam. I get to be myself. I Even now, even with all the therapy I've done and all that, I still do have walls up. Not everybody knows who I really am. Not everybody knows what I'm really like. Not everybody ever gets the actual loud, boisterous, joking chat. Some people get the, the mean, disgruntled leprechaun, right? Like, it's, it is... <coughs> It all, it all depends on a lot of things, and I get to be myself, I get to have a, an outlet, I get to have a way to express myself in, in ways that aren't always acceptable. I, I work a job where I'm in management, which means that I work in the corporate world. I don't get to be myself fully in my job either. I still have to play the corporate game. And it's not a game I like playing, per se. I'm not... You have to wear a shirt that's only one color. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, today was the first day it was really nice out. And we were walking. We walked to the Cornwall Center, and I wore my Lego shirt. And I, we, we walked by some gangbangers who were in certain gangs that are known here in Regina, that are known as violent gangs. Uh, I passed some homeless people. I passed normal people. Everybody's like, we love your shirt. I'm, I said to Alicia, I'm like... I don't think anyone in Saskatchewan is used to people in shirts with more than two colors. And she started laughing. She goes, yeah, I, I don't think so either. <laughs> and I mean, it, it was it was great, right? People were asking me where the shirt came from, how much it cost, what, what, what size was it? Because as soon as they found out where it came from, they're like, well, how, how do you do your sizing? So there are actually people intrigued by this stupid shirt. And I talked to a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds on my 20-minute walk from here to the Cornwall Center and then on my 20-minute walk back. All right. Uh, Seventh Time Grower is chiming in, letting him know that he just subscribed to Beers for Breakfast. Fantastic. Hey, I bet Drew's excited about that. Uh, I bet you that's true. That's true, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, your beer with... Uh, with sausage, was it sausage and asparagus? Uh, smoked meat and asparagus. I've brewed with meat, I don't know, three or four times, and it, it, I'm not. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't throw me into a world of world of shock. But asparagus, what were you trying to get out of asparagus? Because I know with meat you can get like a roast beer, you can get like a smoke character that goes into the. Uh, into the beer. Asparagus, though, you got me on that one. I brewed with trees, gummy bears, meat. Um, to an extent, we were just going kind of for the kind of for the botanical flavor you get from Equinox. And also he was he was trying to get a little bit of the chloroform out to get a little bit more of a green color. So we were just kind of going for that that almost green pepper flavor as mm -hmm. well as as well as a little bit of color we didn't really get it but we tried and for those of you that don't know who george is george is actually a guru of the ontario craft beer world he has been the head brewer at about 15 different breweries he is now one of the head professors at the niagara college teaching brewery he is an amazing crazy man and uh, you can learn a lot from him just by talking to him for a few minutes. What's on the grill? It's Brew here. Didn't realize I didn't subscribe to your channel with my other channel. What's on oh, the grill? See, that, that would be uh, beer for breakfast right there. Just with a different name. Okay. Uh, so that brings me to, um, you've been doing a little bit of home brewing. Talk to us about your homebrew. Uh, I wouldn't even call that homebrew. <laughs> I have never, and I've made extract kits before. I've made Cooper extract kits and all that. Still in the bucket and you're doing all this fucking boiling and everything. That was the biggest joke of a brew ever. But if that tastes good, I'm super excited. Because okay. it's so, so easy. And it, 
It looks like it'll be fine. I mean, most extract kits, if you spice them up a little bit with your own little touches, they're they're great, as, as you know as well. Uh, most extract kits, even if you don't spice them up, they're acceptable at, at best, uh, especially for the price. I mean, I paid, I paid, well, they were $20 on the shelf. I get 20% off, so they were $16 bucks, um, for two two gallons of beer. I got uh, nine, nine 740-milliliter bottles out of it i can't complain about that for for 16 dollars if it tastes okay i mean if i if i order more on the on online if i order more mr beer kits the beer kits are about 25 bucks a piece but even that isn't that bad of a price i have two kits left like the just the cans the the refill cans okay. and then there is two full kits with the fermenter and bottles still sitting on the shelves at work that I might actually buy on next payday just just to get two more fermenters because like we talk about I could do anything with these I could start making pickles I can start making lots of things out of this stuff so when I made my uh, my recent batch here of rocket fuel which is about a pound of sugar brown sugar a splash of tang and bread yeast this stuff is gonna make you sing La Bamba in Swahili by the time it's done fermenting but again, like that, I'm just a hobbyist. It had nothing to do with making booze. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a gardener. I draw. I write. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a brewer. Um, uh, when I was doing brewing, I was making just as many pickles as I was doing uh, beer. And I think you're just of the same vein of me. You just you like to make stuff. You like to create. Well, yeah, and I mean, like I said, I bought the. It was also twenty dollars on the shelf. But I bought the the all grain kit that was sitting there too, and I wasn't. It was four years past date as well. I had no desire to try and do anything with that grain. It actually went into the. It, I made dog biscuits with it actually, but um, I bought it solely for the for the airlock, for the bung, for the racking tube, the racking wand, the uh, like the stuff that came in it is what I wanted out of that kit. Right, and I I bought it for that, and it's going to do great for that. I mean, all the stuff sitting on the shelf with the with the Mister Beer kits, and I mean, I, like I said, the Mister Beer kits, I wouldn't even call that really brewing. It was it was hysterical, you know. Sanitize the thing, boil your water for five minutes, add the don't even boil the wort. It was add the <laughs> add the liquid, stir it put it in the fucking fermenter with the cold water to hit the right temperature, put the yeast in, put it downstairs. I'm like, this is like a five minute brew. This is hysterical. This is easy as shit. Who can't do this? And then I was reading the time limits they were giving you, right? They're like, it's going to take you half an hour to brew, half an hour to bottle. I go, what, what are you talking about? But if it turns out great, if it doesn't turn out, we'll go. I think I took about two hours to make my first extract kit, and all I did was pour wort into a bucket and, uh, and add, add yeast. But at least kits like that, what they do is they take the intimidation out of brewing. The reason it took me two hours is I was paranoid with sanitizing everything and reading everything three and four times. Oh, yeah, the first the first Cooper kit I ever made, it took me a lot longer to do than I it probably should have. The first all grain kit I did, it took me longer than it should have. The first commercial brew I did, it took me longer than it should have. Like it, every time you you step up, you you think that your your past experiences will make it so that you're not scared to do the thing. But at the same time, you're like, oh fuck, what if I fuck up? <laughs> I remember the first brewery that let me go in and brew a batch with them. We we sat down, we made a recipe, we did everything else, and then he was like, you know what, you're in charge, do it. And I was sitting there going, oh my god. Because this is your brewery. What if I fuck up? What if I cost you money? And it was one of those, right? And uh, everything turned out well. He, he sold out of the batch. Uh, he's never made the batch again, but it's because we were using things that we wouldn't normally use. It was, right. we opened his fridge and we're like, what are we trying to get rid of? And we what did you make? Uh, we made a uh, we made a porter, but we made very non-traditional uh, yeast and non-traditional hops. And it was basically just hops and yeast he was trying to get rid of. And we're like, let's see if we can make this work. <laughs> what am it I, uh, okay. It worked okay. 
when I, when I would go on a big brew palooza and make about four or five beers um, over the course of a weekend, doing uh, predominantly uh, extract brewing, there was always a, there was always extras left over. And I remember I would call something extra pale ale, didn't matter what the hell it was. It was just I'd look at it and say, you know, what? I think there's enough for a beer here. Uh, Chad, pull up any more comments if you want. Um, I just want to ask uh, the, the guys one up too. right now from uh, Seventh on the Grill is a new one, and then there's two more after that. Okay. Because I want to ask the group here: um, uh, Does anyone here? Uh, does anyone here brew? Anyone interested in brewing? And even in regards to brewing as well, like I said, it's not necessarily just making beer. Uh, is anybody making uh, kombucha, uh, sourdough bread? Uh, fermenting, making pickles, sauerkraut. I just want to hear from everybody. Okay. Okay, next uh, we have this comment, which I think you were waiting for. There is Dave. Quick drop in, freelancing work, a bit robust. Love your recent reviews. Well caught up. Hey, everyone. Cheers. Hey, everybody. Dave's here. Um, Hopefully you're having a good time, Dave. Maybe another go around the room, what everyone's drinking. I'm sticking with the uh, 1993 ice beer theme. I don't know if you've heard of the style of beer, Chad. Uh, this is from these folks at Carling. This is Carling Ice. Apparently, this stuff used to make you put your shoes on backwards. Um, I think your old review for this, it was 6.5% alcohol, and uh, it was probably only about 10 bucks for, uh, I don't know, maybe a dozen? Probably something close to that. What's, what's it at now? Is it still 65 Five and a half. Really? Yeah. That was uh, definitely uh, get cranked up on the cheap stuff. <laughs> I know this is a Brian comment. I'm I'm recognizing my bl blind eyes can't see anything, but I can see the pictures. That's all right. You sound half dead anyway. Uh, Brian says, does this mean you're going to be doing home brewing regularly? But I think you already alluded to that. You're not necessarily going to be doing home brewing, but you're going to be doing home brewing and pickling and making licorice and cabbage and all kinds of yeah, I, I'm, you know what, as we, and again, as we become more and more established and we get out of the bullshit uh, credit hole that we've been in since leaving the Northwest Company and all that, uh, we're going to start doing more and more things. I actually want to start gardening again. Uh, there's plans I have for things I want to do with the garden. And with I would love to homebrew with some some of my garden. As well with this with this current economy i think just about everybody needs to get into gardening uh dave says he'd love to make a dill pickle vodka does that has that ever been mainstream produced yes sounds, there's been a familiar. few that were sold in the lcbo and such okay well we're going to uh keep going with the theme here i want to talk to you about beer and cooking Okay. Is there, is there a beer that you regularly pick up uh, when you are making a certain food? Not to consume with. I'm talking about cooking with uh, beer. It has been. Or, or baking. Or just it in the has kitchen been a good five or six years since I've cooked with beer. Since I left Ontario to go to the Arctic. Okay. However, that being said... Was there a beer I picked up quite often for that? Yes. I would usually pick up, when I did my uh, my pulled pork, I would usually either add a stout, and it was normally Guinness if I was adding it, or uh, Rickard's Red to my, to my pulled pork. It depended on whether or not I was worried about somebody not eating it because of the color. Because if right. I was worried about the color, I wouldn't use... I, I loved... The mouthfeel and the flavor the Guinness added to my pulled pork. However, the Rickards Red added close to the same flavor and didn't make it look like it was death blood coming out of your ass. Right. So every once in a while, I would switch it up depending on whether it was me and my family eating it or if it was guests eating it. If it was guests, I would switch to the Rickards Red and I'd be like, look, guys, it's not going to make the meat as tender as I like it, but you're going to be more willing to eat this because it's not going to be like black on your on your bun right um other than that uh most of the time when i cook with beer it's whatever loggers out there right like if i'm making uh if i'm making onion rings or i'm making homemade chicken fingers or anything like that and i'm beer battering it it's whatever the fuck is available uh 
but if I'm if I'm making a sauce or I'm making a uh, a meat product, it's usually Rickard's Red or Guinness. Okay. Uh, I tend to bake with it. Uh, there's a recipe that just by Google, it's just as simple as it sounds. Nana's Beer Bread. N-A-N-A. -A. Nana's Beer Bread. It's incredibly simple to make. Uh, it's basically, it's three ingredients. It's um, well, fl it's flour, sugar, and beer, pretty much. Uh, you can add certain things. You can add oatmeal, whatever. You give it a little bit of a texture. But the biggest thing about it, what I really enjoy about it, is no matter what beer you pick, even if it's a pale lager or pilsner, Labatt Blue, something that's cheap at the, at the grocery store, what I'm saying is you will pick up on that flavor in the bread. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm a big fan of using Hawker Shore, using a little bit of lemon zest. It's a, it's a bread that comes out very, very dense. It's almost like a coffee cake. So it's good to go with some of the uh, sweeter notes, Guinness. And that's um, something good to note because I could uh, we make we make bannock quite often. Uh, we also make uh, a bunch of other stuff quite often that that my my wife's trying to because she knows how much my grandmother meant to me and everything that happened in my upbringing. She right. is actually trying to learn how to make Irish soba bread, and. Beer would actually be a very good substitute for the water in that, so I might actually suggest something like that to her. Even one of our favorite beers there, that uh, non-alcoholic uh, Amber Ale from President's Choice. That's great. Oh yeah, I'm sure that would that would do amazing too. Because you don't really want to spend too much money on something you're going to be cooking with anyway. Another very very generous and incredibly appreciated charitable donation from Matt Humphrey. Cheers, boys. I'm drinking a beer I haven't had in years. Schooner. I don't remember the last time I had it. I don't know if I've had Schooner. Schooner is a Maritimes beer. And uh, it. I I had it. I can't remember. And, and again, thank you very much, Matt. Thank you. Um, the, last, I, the last time, the only time I've had Schooner, it was sent to me. And I believe, I don't remember if Schooner is the New Brunswick or the Nova Scotia beer i don't remember if it's oland or uh or mm, or moosehead that actually makes it um well but, i think mr humphrey can probably glue us in yeah he, he can i'm just trying to remember if it would have been nick or lee that sent me the schooner i can't i'd have to go and see, find the video but i've had schooner once in my life and I believe I was trying to drink it out of a schooner, but I didn't have a schooner, and I didn't have anybody that would go and acquire me a schooner from a restaurant. Uh, Brian's still rocking his uh, uh, his gauntlet of Sapporo. Okay, we got Dave. Again, I can't see what they're saying, but I can see the picture. That's a, I'll read for you, but uh, the, uh, Dave, um, with a, a wonderful compliment for the two of us, he says, he says we're a great combo, and that's Dave's opinion. Well, thank you very much, Dave. I think you might be the only person with that opinion. Uh, Brian Smith, do you want me to list today's beer run for you? Yes. Okay, sure. Let's let's find out what's going to be reviewed in the future. And um, just a little bit back, uh, we got a comment here from Dave. I can't remember who was who else is with us in the room. But I think it sounds like he's drinking scotch. Uh, like I, I couldn't pronounce it. Uh, Languidus uh, sixteen. That's brutal. Lagunitas? Um, that might have been it. Oh, when I was when I would drink hard liquor, Lagunitas 16 was my favorite. <laughs> oh, I, I miss Lagunitas 16, but I will never touch hard liquor again in my life. But oh, do I miss it. You like the stuff, but it doesn't like you. Yeah, I don't, uh, I, nothing go about back it. To, can you go back there to uh, back to Dave? Okay, yeah, sorry. Anyone try Black Horse? Speaking of East Coast beer, I had a Black Horse sent to me by uh, Clint. I believe his name was. Uh, there is a guy in uh, in New Newfoundland who would send me the odd beer run here and there when I lived in Pavernatuk, and I had Black Horse, and it was not bad. I mean, if I'm thinking about I'm living in Newfoundland and it's one of the cheap beers, and this it, it was not bad. If I'm thinking I'm a big craft beer geek and I like my craft beers, it, it wasn't good. But if I'm looking at the beer on a whole, it was not a bad beer. 
All right, Chad, we're going to have to get you to step up your East Coast game tonight. Uh, we've got a charming comment from Middle Fry. He says, what the well, fuck? Before, before he you... yells at us, Paul, <laughs> Paul. Uh, you went live for about 30 minutes earlier tonight, and I didn't think you'd be back on. He was doing a little uh, a little pre-gaming for, uh, for the show. I even said in that 30 minutes, I'm like, we will be live in about an hour and a half. Come on, Paul. <laughs> How are you, buddy? Um, I don't need to start with an um. I know what I'm talking about. Do you intend? Yeah, he's drinking. Uh, Dave's drinking scotch tonight. Uh, I told you that James Ready Six was going to steer you away. <laughs> it's a different animal. Chad, what do you see for popular trends for summer? I'm a big baseball guy, and they're really pumping Bud Light Double Lime. Double Lime. What what's double lime? Is it just like a five or six percent alcohol lime? It's the same uh, Bud Light lime, just with twice the lime. Okay, so they're saying that you're going to really taste the lime cordial. <laughs> that's right. Okay, okay. So um, if I don't that's expect, what I don't, they're I don't, going on, if yeah. that's what they're going on, then they're anticipating that the craft beer world will be a very very fruity summer. And I mean, they say okay. that the they say the mild winter might do really well for fruit growers. They also say it might do horrible for fruit growers because of drought. So okay. <coughs> I know there is a lot of farmers here worried about drought because uh, there is not enough. There wasn't enough snow for the soil to be as saturated as it should be for some of their some of their growth. Uh, I don't know how it sat in like Niagara and stuff because Niagara is like Canada's fruit basket, where Saskatchewan is Canada's bread basket. But uh, so if that's again, if that's the way they went, then they're expecting very fruity notes over the summer. And can I, we not? I, uh, sorry, Chad. Just with what you're saying, can we not expect a lot more? extract fruit in beers just with the economy that we're all feeling i really hope not but you are probably 100 percent correct i mean the amount of craft breweries that i have drank so far since getting out of the arctic that okay. were that were extract beers for fruit was kind of scary to be honest um it really was it was <laughs> I shouldn't have as many extract beers in my mouth from craft breweries. If you're going to sell me a rhubarb strawberry beer or a rhubarb raspberry beer or anything like that, it better have rhubarb and raspberries in it or rhubarb and strawberries. It shouldn't have extracts. But if, if they can brew on the... you're going to charge me, especially when you're that, charging the craft beer prices. I'm going, that's right where I was going in regards to if they can lessen up on the ingredients... Can we start seeing pint cans a bit more in the two and a half dollar range? Not everything three and three and well, change. And that's the thing, right? You can't tell me that it costs you just as much money to make a uh, raspberry beer that doesn't actually have raspberries in it. You can't mm -hmm. tell me it costs as much money to make a blueberry beer that has food coloring and blueberry extract in it, as opposed to doing one with blueberries in it. Uh, I've been told that Saskatchewan is huge for uh wheat beers and pale ales over the summer and i'm like i really hope that that's not your fucking summer seasonals because if your regular beers are your summer seasonals i <laughs> might actually have a conniption fit like <laughs> it might happen i might break down and cry if all i see is wheat beers but i could see it because you know the wheat harvest happens so there's all this wheat that you can get for nothing so i i could see it and that's what worries me i'm like oh my god am i going to be in a in a like plethora of Hefeweizens, Crystal Weizens, and Belgian Wits. Right. I used to say I really like those styles. I don't know if I can say I really like those styles when they're like, hey, it's the summer. Here's a wheat beer. Um, because you're, <laughs> you're always used to getting... Sorry, I, there was just a lot of noise coming from upstairs for a second there. You're always used to getting like sours and fruits and, and stuff like that. And I think... Again, if 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 Bud is doubling down with Bud Double Lime, 
I think that that's what they're expecting the trends to be is a bunch of uh, fruited loggers and stuff like that. And I mean, I've seen a lot of fruited loggers already. There's the guava logger. There's the Mexican lime loggers. There's there's so many fruited loggers already out there where I'm sitting in central Canada that I could see it become the big thing right now. Uh, just before I get to Matt's comment, I just I just want to go back on that. Just saying that if we are going to see a bunch of raspberry, strawberry, blueberry beer this year, and if we are going to go the extract route, I'm just repeating myself at this point. But yeah, just take it easy on us because those beers. Um, I remember a, a certain hibiscus beer that came out of Montreal. Those things you can just absolutely powder them back. But when you're getting it to, you're talking about four dollars a can. It's just not fair. <laughs> And, uh, Matt Humphrey okay, is going to give us so, some education on. Uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say the other thing is if I'm going to get all pale ales here, I'm okay right. if they're like specialty pale ales. Like, give me a raspberry pale ale or a hibiscus or that stuff is actually kind of interesting to me. I've had tangerine pale. Like those things are actually interesting to me or sour pails. And but just an average pale, if that's your summer seasonal, I'm going to cry. Okay. Continue. I was going to say, or pick up your own uh, essences around the house. Get your own blueberry essence and just add it to a pale ale. Uh, Matt Humphrey here is just giving us our education on schooner. Schooner was first brewed in Halifax by the Olins from the Olin Brewery in Halifax, sold to Labatt's Imbev in the 70s. I think Moosehead has no affiliation, although the Olins own Moosehead. Laugh out loud. Okay, so schooner is is labat um and that's what i was trying to remember was whether or not it was oland or the big guy that that made schooner okay uh middle for paul oh by the way i thought you knew everything in regards to the beer you mentioned languitas i believe that's a california brewery well like uh, you're killing me on this stuff paul Lagavulin? How do you like that? Uh, is the hard stuff. I'll let it slide this time. Didn't I say Lagavulin? Yeah, or I butchered it. We both butchered it, I think. I hope I sound just I hope I sound just like Paul. Well. Uh, and uh, Lagunitas. Uh, who bought them? One of the big guys bought them. Or was it another craft brewery? That, somebody bought them for like one... Uh, for a lot of money, for a lot of money, I was gonna say like one billion dollars, but that that's insane. But they bought them for an insane amount of money still, and I can't remember who it was because I I'm I'm getting back into the industry. Okay, leave me alone. I'm getting back in. Uh, Dave is chiming in on our last topic. There, he says, "Fruit Loops full beer." Rhino's disappointment was palatable. Speaking of fruits. And it was. I mean, that beer was sold to me for a lot of money. It was a Fruit Loop Sour. If you're going to sell me a Fruit Loop Sour, it better have Fruit Loops in it. It better have fucking Fruit Loops in it. And then when I saw there was no Fruit Loops in it, I was like, you motherfuckers. You just sold me on some false fucking advertisement. Again, you can't brew with Fruit Loops. I mean, you can't put them in the mash because it just converts to sugar. Your mash will turn pink and purple as soon as you add it to the kettle but you can secondary with fruit loops if we have to really clear that up what do you got ghosts over there chad well, that was my wife <laughs> alicia let's listen in folks this is gonna get good what's that she said police okay it's gonna stir that kettle uh, Brian Smith is going to just unload with some beer names here. Counterpart Snickers Roller, Bounty Roller, Blender Raspberry Apricot, Hypnotized Fruited Sour Raspberry Blueberry Grapefruit. That's what I sound like when I get into this stuff and then take a little trip down the road. Do you know what Brian's talking about? Yeah, that's uh, his beer list. Oh. He picked up. Okay. <laughs> As Drunkioni said last week, I know the big words. It just takes me a bit to spit them out. 
Oh, so, I, I with love all, with, him. Um, now, this is one for everybody, and this really falls in great with all this uh, East Coast beer talk. I want to talk to you about nostalgic beers. What's a beer that makes you nostalgic? What's a beer you get nostalgic for? Whether it even exists to this day anymore or not, what's a, what's a beer that takes you back? And we all heard that. I think Otis was on the couch. I'm pretty sure Otis was on the couch because that was get the fuck yeah. off the couch. <laughs> That's nice. Precious. Yeah. Yeah. I love my wife. She has Croatian blood in her. Don't piss her off. Ladies and gentlemen, we take 30 seconds for retooling. This is NBC's broadcast of Interview with the Rhino. At this point, we recite the alphabet backwards. Audio not included. Uh, anybody else in the chat room got anything to say? <laughs> Popcorn, peanuts, anybody? Brian Smith says oh. DC Falls, North Street Lager, Copper Beach Red Ale, Shipman Stout, Shipman Stout, pardon me, Draft Pick, Spring Smash. That's interesting sounding beer. QR code for a survey on this one if you should all let me touch that again. QR code for a survey on this one should become a main brew. Like he's talking about draft pick spring smash. I don't know what the f and here I am around the show. Uh Dave is jumping in. At Continue. We'll we'll do the next two comments and then uh you'll have to repeat your question. Okay. Uh, well, we're just talking about beers that make us nostalgic. Uh, Dave is going about his Gramps drink, Cincy. Okay. Um, I've talked about it several times. Old Vienna, the very first drink I... The very first beer I ever had. Um, right. Guinness, very first beer I ever shared with my dad. Um, and... Ooh. The original Innocent Gun, which was the very first beer that I drank, and I was like, wow, beer could taste like this. And I think those are the three that I get nostalgic for, and I still have a soft spot for all three of them in my heart. And uh, that soft spot does make me sometimes look at Innocent Gun as a better beer than it probably should be. Mm -hmm. But it is what it is. Uh, Innocent Gun came out at just the right time in Ontario, and I think a lot of us had that experience with Innocent Gun. It was just, it was something completely different. Even the college kids were calling it, hey, try this. It's 6%, and it's like taking a sh shot of whiskey with a beer. I'll never forget overhearing that. You know, Innocent Gun made quite the impression on on a lot of us, even when uh, almost to the point, um, I don't know if anyone else can in the chat room can e echo this thought, when they started to kind of stray a little bit, they started coming up with different types of beers. It almost felt like you've already got it with the um, uh, with the barrel aging. Just stick with uh, just stick with the regular innocent gun. It was fantastic stuff. I know it's changed since uh, since it has, but we all have. Uh, I can't control the uh, groups here or the uh, chats. I'm gonna chime in with Laker Red. It's really not that long ago, but I probably started brewing close to 20 years ago. And my first brew was an amber ale. And Laker Red is a rare, affordable red lager that you can get. And it's still, it's a tasty brew. It's afford, like I say, it's affordable. And eh, it just kind of takes me back to their marketing, too. Back when uh, Laker Red was out about 20 years ago, the fact that it's 5.5% alcohol was very, was very loud. <laughs> I think the 5.5 was written louder than Laker Red. 
Paul says, I've been talking to Dio in chat. The three of us got to hook up in a stream one of these days. Hopefully, Dio will let us talk too if he's watching. I owe you, bud. And that Paul, would be a he, drunken one. Well, next uh, next weekend, like I said, we just alternate week to week. It's the grand piss up uh, next weekend. So I'm going to get everybody in here and have at it. Uh, Dave chimes in with Red Dog. I want to I want to talk to you about that one a little bit. Red Dog Black Label. He says particularly for the uh, for the commercials. Red Dog commercials were great. And uh, Black, I think Black Label had the uh, commercials with Michael Ironside, did it not? That's uh, that's Labatt Ice. Oh, you're right, Labatt Ice. Yeah. Uh, Red Dog. That was that was fun. Now, Dave, is it mostly the commercials you're nostalgic for? Because I don't remember guys walking out of the beer store with cases of Red Dog. I think it was actually expensive at the uh, at the time that it was out. Actually, for those quirky, gimmicky beers, uh, Chad, did you ever try Three Stooges beer? No, I didn't know Three Stooges had a beer. It's uh, it. Oh, I think it might be a brick product. It might be. Only came in a two four, and it was not cheap. And there were often bottles that were filled just with water, and it was supposed to be kind of like a <laughs> like a joke, you know, like the Three Stooges were making the beer. Not everyone was too fucking impressed when it was uh, damn near forty bucks for for a two four. We're going twenty years ago. Matt Humphrey chiming in, talking about nostalgic beer, Labatt Fifty. It was the first beer I stole my old man. Stole from my old man. He drank it and puked all over the place. <laughs> uh, Paul chimes in, going back to Black Label. He says, and I believe Black Label had the original painted labels on the bottles. That's interesting. Do you know what he's talking about, Chad? He's got me on that one. He's talking about like when they did the uh, well, when they do the. Yeah painted labels the uh i don't have anything here with it but when there's no sticker it's the the silk screened almost labels i see excuse me and uh dave's just uh going back to what i was asking he says he was talking more or less about the uh about the black label commercials more than uh, more than the beer itself i like to think i go back a lot further than laker red uh i love the wildcat wildcat strong they still make it but they changed the recipe, and it's got a real hard water taste to it. Very, very metallic. Uh, Dave had uh, Dave tried the uh, the Three Stooges. It was palatable stuff from from what I recall. It was just it was just a basic brick lager beer. Uh, oh, Paul did send me the label from the holiday beer, and yeah, I can say I've never seen that in my life. Okay. Uh, Brian chiming in. I think we're still talk talking about <laughs> nostalgic beers, but he's <coughs> Brian has sucked back a lot of craft beer. I'm getting yeah, I'm getting sick just through the microphone. Uh, mm. This you, uh, Sir Isaac Pale Ale, 32K IPA, Morning Star Cream Ale, Lighthouse Lager. Somebody tell me more about Lighthouse Lager. Okay, so the the Morning Star you can send me but that one won't be reviewed i actually you know what i will because i reviewed that last when they were a contract brewery and now they're a brick and mortar uh dave's going on about how he can't get caffrey's anymore in the lcbo so Caff caffrey's and botting speaking of um go ahead sorry there was a beer that i wanted to bring up um when we talked the last time, last we did this interview, and we talked about tea beers. Okay, I'm not going anywhere until I got you. Until I got you. Uh, when's the last time you had a Tetley's? Tetley's English ago? Pub Ale. <coughs> no, not a decade ago. Um, when did we do the review? We did that review. Actually, the review would have been about a decade, maybe. A maybe 12 years ago, 12 to 10 years ago. So the last time I had... One of those Tetley's, basement reviews? Yes. The last time I had a Tetley's would have been eight years ago. Uh, more so, I was, able, I was able to get Boddington's more than Tetley's. Tetley's tastes better than Boddington's. Boddington's kind of tastes like 
gym socks. But um, I think King Abbott was another beer in that uh, in that category of those nitro bottles that pretty much all come out of the same brewery. Uh, yeah. uh, Paul's going on about the middle of his high school days. Higher ABV was cool. So Molson, Brador, uh, Labatt's Extra Stock uh, were for the cool kids. I, speaking of these high-octane beers, I did a little research today because I was trying to get a little bit more information about uh, our good friends at Stella Artois. Do you know that Stella makes one of the most highest octane malt liquors on the planet? Atlas Mega Strong 16 Malt Liquor. There's oh, maybe there, there's maybe five reviews of it on on YouTube, and I can see how it it's alcohol differed uh, through regions. The lowest I saw it come in at was twelve. But the stuff that comes right out of the brewery uh, from our good folks at Stella is, uh, yeah, Atlas, mega strong. <laughs> you need your um, Optimus Prime voice for uh, for a beer like that. So is that mostly a European beer? Like, as far as I know, it's still complete. It's still totally active, and uh, yeah, it's. I, I wouldn't call it widely available. Not not here anyway, but. My very angry wife just went upstairs, so I'm going to go and try and take a pee. Uh, I'll hold the fort, but I can't get anybody's response. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you a funny story. So about 200 years ago, uh, I was a construction laborer. I was, I was barely 18. And it was in the summertime, break was coming up, the worldwide 10 o'clock, it's time for break. And I felt like having a pop. There was a convenience store down at the end of the street, and I figured, you know, I'm not a selfish guy, so I, I go around and ask anybody else if anybody else, anybody else wants a pop. Bright move, F Grave. It's a fucking construction site. Nobody wants a pop. So by the end of it, I had a two by four with a list on it with about 16 different brands of cigarettes. I didn't even smoke myself. I make my way to the convenience store with my two by four and my backpack remember all i wanted was a fucking coke i go into the convenience store and there's only one other guy in there and he's yapping away to the cashier cashier is a korean guy big surprise i'm in the back and i overhear the guy that's yapping away to the cashier that uh the rain last night around 8 p.m it came down and it came down so hard that it kind of hurt and I thought to myself, oh, poor baby. Did you get hit by the rain? At that time, I had this thing with, you know, getting to bed at a, uh, a good early time. I was definitely in bed by about 8 o'clock. So out pops from my lips. I said, well, you don't go out that time of night. The guy stops and he looks at me. He says, what do you mean you don't go out that time of night? I look at there and I think, oh, there's no going back to the vault on this one. You know, did I think I said it? No, I fucking said it. So what am I going to do? Am I going to try and talk my way out of it or do I just dig in a little bit deeper? So I start laughing, but I start laughing with a real instigator laugh. <laughs> <laughs> the guy that I'm laughing at, he gives me the look that I deserve. The Korean guy behind the counter, he has no idea what the fuck is going on, but he sees me laughing. So he figured somebody started telling a joke. So he starts laughing. <laughs> so now, because he's laughing, he's got me laughing, and the two of us are pointing at the guy laughing. The guy uh, backpedals like something out of, a, out of a horror movie and splits. I, uh, I, 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 I finish up laughing like, <laughs> like that. As soon as I stop laughing, the Korean guy stops laughing on a dime. I go up to the counter with my two by four, order my cigarettes. I got my coke, and I said, "All right, see you tomorrow." Good luck to the guy that uh, that ran out. Try and tell that story on the fucking water cooler. Oh yeah, sure, that happened, Mark. Have a couple of drinky poos on your lunch break. All right, that's enough of me. Back to the show here. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was saving something up. I was saving something up because I knew my wife was going to come down at some point tonight. I didn't know that either my kids or my dogs or somebody. <laughs> made the made the devil come out of her, but when she came okay. down, I was gonna tell her. I was gonna tell her she was a bitch. 
right? I was going to say, my wife is a bitch. And as soon as she looked at me, I was going to say a beautiful, intelligent, talented, caring human and see what <laughs> happens. But as soon as she came down here ready to fucking stab somebody's eyes out with her fucking toenails, I was like, yeah, no, no, no. It's just it, whatever happened, happened. I don't know. Uh, I just tried to keep the floor warm. If there's anybody in here after my story, uh, let's get uh, PD's in the house. PD says he, uh, he who's PD? Chad? He's from this area. No, oh, it's a he? <laughs> PD in the house that drank Calgary and Bo in high school. Doesn't drink anymore. Had enough of it. Uh, uh, Dave's it is true. Dave's he uh, he actually watches these Thanks, videos. Dave. He does not. Uh, he does not partake. <laughs> I thought I cleared the room. Uh, that's pretty much it. In regards right. to uh, regards to topics, if you want to go any more on nostalgic beers, that was what we uh, were talking about before you uh, had your. Uh... Oh, you're you're out of topics already. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I I like I said, um, I know Brian had asked about if somebody knew the bar they first drank at. Uh, my question, Brian, if you're still here, is are we talking about the first bar we legally drank at or the first bar we drank at? Because those are two different stories for me. Right. Because I was working and drinking at Peter's Pantry in Ottawa for about three years uh, prior to hitting 19. And when I turned 19, they found out it was my 19th birthday. And I was given a lifetime ban. I was fired. I was, yeah, it, it was a good time. Um, but the first beer I ever had at Peter's Pantry was, was a Coors. A Coors Light. Um, was it my favorite thing ever? No. Uh, first beer I had legally, I would have went to the prior and it wasn't even a beer. It, my first drink at the prior, and it was my drink every time I went to the prior, because this is when my my depression and everything started really slipping. And my first uh, my first drinks at at the bar was uh, was at the prior in Arm Prior, Ontario, and it was a uh, whiskey sour. And I would always order whiskey sours. Whiskey sours were two seventy five a sour. I'd throw down a five dollar bill for every sour. I was working at McDonald's at the time, so I was making like six eighty five an hour. So every hour of my work after taxes and all that, I would be able to get one whiskey sour, and I would go in and spend eight, ten, twelve hours worth of work on whiskey sours, and then I would take a taxi home, or I would walk home from Iron Prior to Brayside. And it was, it was what it was. Sorry, uh, PD, what was this? Uh, I live in Calgary from Saskatoon. Worked in Regina. Plays hockey in Moose Jaw. Okay, Joe, Jay uh, knows ways in the way. Uh, in the house, pardon me. We need to get Rhino do hot sauce reviews. Half bottle minis work for hot ones. Have you had hot sauce in the Saskatchewan? Anything new that... Uh... I haven't had anything since getting here, but... Well, actually, that's a lie. I do have two new hot sauces upstairs. I just haven't tried them yet. Okay. Uh, Dave says, my first real drink was during my time working with a high school. It was the end of summer, a barbecue lunch. I drank, and I had to paint the lines on the basketball court. It was a disaster. I've always heard stories of people drinking on the job, and I'm like, really? I have never been able to drink on it. I had guys that would come in and work for me at the Northwest Company, and here's the problem with the Northwest Company, right? You're in these small fly-in only communities where you can't get any other workers. So if your workers do anything other than steal from you, you basically look the other way. And I would have guys show up to work high out of their minds. And every time they went out for a smoke break, it was fucking weed. And they were so fucking strung out, they couldn't put shit on the shelf. Like, one guy took 10 minutes to unload a box of Ritz crackers on the shelf. 
and I had uh, I had our brand new general merchandise manager who is still in Deer Lake right now. There, he goes, "Aren't you going to send them home?" I go, "No." He goes, "Why not?" He, look at look at all the money he's wasting. I go, and if he's not here putting one box of stuff out every ten minutes, guess who's putting out all the boxes of stuff? <laughs> Me. So if I can get six boxes of stuff out in an hour, that's six less boxes I have to put out. And I can't remember if we heard I, – well, not that I don't remember. Did, did I hear back from anybody in the chat room? Is anybody doing anything brewing-related? Anyone taking a stab at kombucha, pickles? Nobody said anything about that. Nothing, eh? All right. Nope. Let's just start our own show. And we have a comment from Gnarled Branch right here from Dave. And then we have two from Paul, and I think we're caught up after that. Oh, hey, wait. What are you drinking there, Ted? Uh, Great Western Rattler. Excellent. Uh, the proper, proper alcohol percentage for a Rattler? 2.5. Right on. <laughs> so, I mean, Actually, I give is... you a, I, I can give you another one, Chad. I just I just don't know how, how deep we can go with this. Do I still have okay. you? Okay. Yeah, you still have me. French beer. Now, French beer is uh, beer is, has been around as long in uh, in France as long as wine has really. Uh, the styles that come out of France, as far as I know, the only one I can really remember is is beer de garde. A beer de garde comes in three different styles, and they're, the alcohol pretty much starts at six and goes to ten. So you can do um, you can do a blonde, you can do an amber, and you can do a dark. It's a pretty messy uh, beer. Like one of the characteristics that you would get out of it that you'd be judged on is it usually smells like a wet basement. It sounds like French beer to me. But after that, what, to, what recollection do you have with any uh, French beer products? Oh, um, French beer products. I like we're talking France, right? Not Quebec. Yeah. Um, the majority of French beer products I've had have been beer to guards, and I just have not enjoyed them at all. The only other stuff I had was Cronenberg and Cronenberg Blanche. And I loved Cronenberg Blanche, but the Cronenberg right. 1664, it was in the green bottle. It tasted like skunk piss. It can go fuck itself like the, uh, like... It can go it fuck a... itself just like the Bearded Guards that I've had. It was in a blue bottle, correct? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, blue, not... Yeah. There was a beer that came out of Paris called Desperados. It was pretty much a 6% malt liquor that had tequila in it. It also came in a clear bottle. Do you remember that? It would be at the beer store. It came in six packs. Desperados. Beer with tequila. Yes, I have had that. Okay, I don't know what the hell's going on. Um, there was a comment just before... Um, Jay knows the way, uh, but he's asking is, what is the rhino's opinion of kombucha? Yay or nay? <sighs> okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a deep sea. It's yay from myself, although it's not my uh, show. I like kombucha. I do. Um... Pretty much, Paul. Uh, Paul has certain uh, beer guards from the Brabant region of Belgium, still French, though, eh? Me, all the same to me. Pretty much, I uh, they, there's there's a lot of historic beer that comes out of France, but we don't. It doesn't really tip the scales over here. What we get is yeah, we got the we got the Cronenberg. I don't know if we ever got a lager. Or something like that, but I mean, it's just because it's it's probably guilty by reputation. You don't see a lot of 
Um, Cronenberg 1664 was their like their their lager, and it was it was green bottles. The Cronenberg Blanche was the blue bottles. Uh, The 1664 and the Cronenberg had the exact same bottles, other than the color. Okay. Uh, The Blanche I really liked. the The 1664 I was not a fan of, but there's not a lot of French beers that i liked uh good night dave uh other than that but yeah the the only beer de guards i had before i had beer de guards that were made here was beer de guards from france uh if i even go into my into my untapped uh, and I got to run after this because apparently my dogs are outside. My daughter. Is Chad, out. I think we're um, I think we're running a bit dry here. I think let's uh, let's just wrap it up. All right, sir. Everybody, love yous. Thank you for joining. That was us. fun. Yeah, we got to go. Goodbye. All right, kids.